guess where I want to start is that I've got a very, very strange view on the world. The handout which I gave you, there's something in it uh, with uh, resources, and there are two videos in there, and they take about 20 minutes, so you're just going to have to watch them in your own time. But basically, these, these videos have a couple of key points. The first most important point which it makes, one of them makes, is that if you think about now versus the future, okay, so let's make this now, let's make this the past, and let's imagine that we're looking at things like the pace of change, the level of complexity, the amount of global interconnectedness. Which one is higher, now or the past? Yeah. Everyone feels this now? Okay, that's easy. Okay, how are those two points joined together? Come. Well, S-curve, it's slowing down. <laughs> Speeding, up. Speeding up. It's a curve that way. More people, more connected, more technology, going faster. No, no brainer. Not interesting. How fast are we learning and changing as the world has accelerated, say, over the past 20 year period? So let's assume we started once above the time above the curve. In the days when we, could, we had budgets which made sense and we could plan and countries had five-year plans. You remember that stuff? So they could learn faster than the world around them was changing. Okay? What's happened to their ability to learn and change? Has it gone up, down? Let's do it together. I'm with the pen horizontally over a 20-year period. If you want to go up, me to go up, say up. If you say it's the same, say same or down. And then we'll get a group view. You with me? No software involved. Okay? Great. So action, go. So there, guys, that's what we have it. We have this thing where, for most of us, the lines have crossed over. Our ability to learn and change has been outpaced by the world changing around us. This, for me, is where it gets interesting. Because, you see, when we talk about return on innovation, it's flipped. Something weird has happened. Let me try and explain. 1960s odd, people like Peter Drucker and people like that started talking about innovation. Okay? And when they talked about innovation, they were looking at how can we talk about innovation, make sense of it. And they looked at the advertising industry. And in the advertising industry, they discovered something. They discovered the more good ideas that you had before you wrote the ad, the more likely you were to have a good idea. You got it? So they came up with a really simple idea. It's called, a concept called the funnel. Have you come across this one before? Basically, the idea is very simple. You put more stuff in here. And as you put stuff in there, good stuff comes out the bottom. Many organizations believe this stuff. So once we're in that world, when we talk about something like failure, it's really easy to understand it because you can learn faster the world is changing. So if you do something wrong, you failed. How should you be treated? The process was there. You could have followed it. Your boss knew better. You failed. How should you be treated? Come on, interactive. It's not. What do you think? Old world. How should you be treated? Fired. fired. Exactly. You didn't follow the procedure. Stuff's up. Fired. Fantastic. Good. Okay. There was only one way to fail. Now we come to this new world, which is changing faster than we can learn. When new things come, where technologies come, which nobody understands in the organization. You bring your PayPal to market, nobody understands it, they block it, they kill it off. They resist it. It fails. You did everything right. You involved people, you involved the organization, you didn't have any pool parties. It was great. You focused, you, I, I, it was great. You didn't make any mistakes. You got it wrong, you failed. How should you be treated? When I work with my clients, I try and explain there are two ways you can fail. There's one way which is called dumb failure, which is doing stuff just badly and wrong. There's also something called smart failure, which is trying to do the right thing, doing all the right processes, de-risking as much as you can do, involving as many people as you can do, and still failing. It's not the same. Do you understand the difference? OK. So those two concepts I need to impart in your minds. Because the first thing is the funnel. The funnel is really dangerous because it doesn't actually work. And I looked at this with one of my clients, Sony. And we looked at the funnel, and we were looking to see whether getting more ideas would make more stuff come out the bottom. And what we discovered was the more ideas they collected, guess what happened? No, less came out. Exactly, slower. Why? Why would that happen? Come, exactly. When you've got one idea, it's fine. You just focus all your resources on it. No one argues. The boss knows about it. It's doing it. You've got 400 ideas. You need a committee. Who do you put on the committee? The wacky, crazy director with the bow tie and the funny legs or what? No. You put the smart accountant who can kill rubbish stuff. So guess what happens? Any novel idea gets wiped out, slapped down. And only the mediocre Me Too ideas go through late because they've gone through the committee and never hit the market with any value. Do you understand the problem? So what we realized was for the world we're living in, the new world, the world after midnight, which is what I call it, this model doesn't actually work anymore. And that's part of what we're doing wrong. We spend a lot of our effort trying to fit this particular model. We play the numbers. No, it's the wrong model. When you start to think about innovation, you have to approach it in a very, very specific way. And the way I do it is I think about it as I describe it as the process of transforming. And then I do an open brackets and I write the words new. And then I close the brackets and I put ideas. Why new ideas? Why do I put them in brackets? Why, do, why is the word new in brackets? You guys aren't very interactive. Right? 
They don't need to be new. They might be new to you, but they're old to someone else. You with me? It, it, once you put new and force people into that, you're going to fail. Into, and then I put something here which is called money. Have you come across this concept? Or society's benefits. And I put that in brackets. Because sometimes society doesn't know what the benefits look like. And that's the way I define innovation. And if you take that model and that idea, you stop thinking about uh, this whole idea of, um, of funnels in the way which you would do. Because the statistics on funnels are really terrible. Um, how many of you have ideas which you write down? How many of you have an idea and then you write it down? Okay, of the ideas you write down, what percentage would you say that you decide, um, okay, this idea, I've not only written it down, I'm going to do something with it. One in. One in. So you have the idea, you write down all of them. No, one in 10 of those. Then you say, I'm going to do something with that. One in 10 of those. And then how many of you get around to doing it, get a budget for it and start to work on? One in. And of those, how many then work through and you involve the right people and they said, one in. Do you understand where I'm going? What's the probability that you're going to go from an idea into money. Small. Um, I invented a method for trying to do instant um, business plans. And I'll try and share it with you. It's called a gap leap. But you can make a business, business case for anything in about 15 minutes. Is that interesting? OK. So what you do effectively is um, I use a little grid like this. And the grid in the middle here, I write the word gap. And the gap is the difference between how things are and how things will be once your innovation is in place. So it might be, for example, I don't know what we should go for. Um, let's go for um, we don't have, what, you, uh, what don't we have? Uh, enough innovation across Newcastle. I'm making it up. Okay. Then the next question you ask yourself is, what happens if we don't fix it? If not fixed, what happens? We'll say, oh, people will not be happy within Newcastle. They'll, the sales will be down. I don't know, people, sales. And you brainstorm with post-its all the things which will happen if you don't do it. And then you do exactly the same thing again, brainstorming. But this time, what you brainstorm is what ha would happen if you fixed it. And then you have a nice discussion about why not fixed yet. And the joy of that is you very, very quickly, within about 15 minute place, case, uh, case, get everything you need for a business case. The downside, you can put a number to that in pounds. What happens if we do nothing over the next year? The upside, you can put a number to that in pounds. The difference between the two, of course, is your value at stake. That's your potential market. Then, why have we not fixed it yet? We haven't built the tech. We haven't got the system. People don't like it yet. You've got your entire business activities. You take the cost of that, divide it into the other one, 15 minutes, you've got a business case. It's good enough to put under somebody's nose. That's called the gap leaf. It's in your pack. Does it make sense? OK. Ideas are really weird. Have you noticed how someone you come out with an idea, it's great, but you have to persuade other people? See, so there are some ideas which you have to push into the marketplace. Can you imagine that? One of my friends, uh, his son invented this hook which goes on the side of chairs so you can hang your bag un underneath it. Have you come across this one? And, um, and uh, one of the other competing products he has is a chair which has a little slot so you can hang your bag between your legs. Excuse me. Do you know how that came about? He spotted that when people have got carrier bags or lots of bags, they put them between their legs to protect them. That's a pull idea. You look at a problem somebody's got, and then you try and respond to them. Can you see the difference? And there's a little bit of fashion around this because sometimes the pull ideas are to do with human beings and what human beings do, and sometimes it's to do with technology. So if, for example, you look at, I don't know, uh, when I was walking here this morning, I went past a, 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 a penny farthing. On, I don't know whether everyone else did that. On uh, Prince, uh, some street, I can't remember the name of the street. So fake penny farthing. Penny farthing, great idea. Things, people jump on them, ride them, big wheels fall over, long way down, die. You got it? <laughs> So somebody came up with gears which allowed you to have smaller wheels. Now that's taken technology and improved it. Can you see that? See the difference between the two? And so what we have is we have this mix between push and pull and between whether it's tech or, or whether it's delivery. And everyone has their own favorites. Some people think that, well, we, our business is about invention. They invent technology and they push it out into the world. Other people say, we improve the way in which the technology works and make the interfaces great. You know I mean? Other people say things like, well, we look at what people need, and then we fill it with insights. Other people say, oh, things like, oh, well, we, we're the fashion business. We come up with new different colors and styles. And everyone thinks they're driving innovation. They're just different types of ideas. The thing is, if you generate the idea yourself, you have to realize the risk is in the rest of the organization, because no one else generated that idea. So just like that hunter-gatherer, they're going to think it's a threat. And so it becomes quite important to structure the way you communicate in a very clever way. I loved the presentation earlier about mobiles allowing us to have a conversation. Conversations are great, but conversations which are driven by questions are even better. 
Because people feel ownership. Once they feel ownership, they're less likely to block things. You know how when you leave here, you have all these ideas and you rush back to share them with everybody and you go, oh, look at these wonderful ideas I got from the ROI conference. Can you imagine that? And when you present this to your team, what will they do? Will they go, yes, let's change everything in the organization all at once now? <laughs> no, of course not. They'll, they'll fold their arms, okay? And then you say, look, this is brilliant, this is wonderful. See, the problem is you've had the idea. It's in your head. You've fallen in love with it. It's like your baby. You want to show it off. So you bring it and say, look at my beautiful baby. They look at it. What do they see? A threat. Okay? So they go, oh, baby, no, it's an ugly baby. It's coming to you. Attack me. <laughs> and then if you're the boss, everyone goes, yes, it's a beautiful baby. And then they leave. <laughs> they leave the meeting and go, it's an ugly baby in there. Okay? And then <laughs> one person stays behind. Always one person. They come up to you and say, that baby you had, uh, that idea you had, it's like one I had two hours ago or three weeks ago, can I help you with it? And you're so pleased, because you think they like your baby. No, you weren't listening. What they said is, the idea I had myself was great. Can I use your resources to feed my baby? <laughs> so we understand engaging commitment is really crucial. The fourth area I want to take us into, if that's okay, is this really crucial one about uh, making, making it possible. For me, the biggest challenge is the scale, the scope, and the fear of things going wrong. You see, people are scared things will go wrong, and they do. But they don't have to, because we're already all trained in how to eliminate risks in any new thing we do. You were trained whilst you thought you were being entertained, watching science fiction films. Has everyone here seen at least one science fiction film? They're all the same. They've got aliens. Aliens' job is to travel millions of light years to come to Earth to eat you. That's all they do. Okay? So I want you to imagine an alien spacecraft has crash landed, I don't know, just there. And I'm walking towards it. What advice would you give me as I approach an alien spacecraft? Walk away. Walk away. Exactly. You say, don't go anywhere near there. Why? Because you know this thing is horribly dangerous and it's going to eat you. Okay? They never do that in the films. They run towards the danger. You with me? And you shout at the TV screen, don't go. But the first thing you've got to realize is that identifying the danger, the things which are going to go wrong, are really important. The second thing which happens is if you're not giving me such good advice, I'd have gone. Alien spacecraft are all the same. When you're outside and they're minute, when you're inside, they're huge. And the aliens are rude. They never come to the door to greet you and say, hello, I'm an alien. No. What happens is you wander around going, hello, aliens, aliens. You can never find the aliens until what happens? The music starts, okay? At which point the aliens leap out and they're towering over you, slimy things, okay? So what do I do? Aliens towering over me. What should I do if I'm going to survive? Run. run. I've got two legs. It's got 26. As I run, he'll just pull me back and slime me. Come on, what do I do? Cut the music. Cut the music. <laughs> I've got to kill it. Thank you very much. You saved my life. Exactly. I've got to kill it. Now, they never do that in the films. Normally, three of them arrive at the spacecraft. They see how big it is. They say the magic words, let's split up. One of them arrives with the music. <laughs> One of the rise of the music, they have laser blasters, but they never blast the alien. They call their friends on their communicators and say, hey, there's an interesting phenomenon, okay? It's all very interesting. Then they get cut off because they've been eaten. Then it hides in the air ducts, randomly biting people. And finally, the only way to get rid of it is to blow up the whole space station, which is what we call Plan B. Now, this particular <laughs> process is called Fix It Now. It's also in your pack. And it's a five-stage process for looking at something you've never done before and systematically removing all the risk. Of course, you can't do it all. But if you do it with other people and they engage and they can see it's not scary, if you do it on behalf of your CEO and say, I thought you'd be worried about this, therefore I've taken these actions. Do you understand? And this is how we start to move forward in innovation. The last bit, which I'm, I'm, I'm sort of going to try and highlight, is execution. The problem we have with the execution is really, really simple. We think it's going to be something which is traditional. Old world, the world where we could learn faster, the world was changing. Most of the time when we started doing something, we know exactly what we needed to do and we know how to do it. I call this painting by numbers, like those books we used to have when we were kids. You got it? You know the method, you know the process, you can follow it, you can track. Bad news. Innovation, is it ever paint by numbers? No. Sometimes you know what you're trying to do, you have no clue how to get there. Sometimes you've built the technology, but you have no idea whether the customers will ever buy it. And sometimes you've just got an inkling, you know something must be done, but you're not sure what to do exactly or how to do it, but it should have been done yesterday. You see that? I give these different types of scenarios names. You'll see in your packs, I talk about paint by numbers, quests, movies, and fogs. You can read about it later. What's more important is that you think about how you approach your innovation. You do not do it like that. If you're lost in the fog, I've called this one here fog. How do you move forward? Do you march boldly in the fog, or do you take one step, holding hands, communicating? How is it for you? Next step, review, next step. That's how you move forward in the fog. I watch organizations or people, and they will not review whether their, their idea is going forward properly for months. And then they'll bring in the customers in a focus group a year later or six months. Are you crazy? If it's foggy, the customers should be there living with you. They should be sitting on your knee. Are you with me? You should all be in there together. 
If the goal is clear and the method's move, missing, it's a quest. What did King Arthur do? Did he send one knight out and say, find the Holy Grail, you? No, he sent loads of people out. When you look at the quiz questions you came up with, one of the things you scored lowest on was getting multiple teams to address the same issue. Why? Are you trying to save money? How does that work? So Arthur sent one person out, go out, just you, and come back in 100 years' time, and then we'll continue and see how the market's growing. No, he sent all his knights, hundreds of them, all in parallel. Best chance of success. The only mistake, of course, he made was having fired them up and sent them off. He forgot to tell them to come back at Christmas. In the old days, there were no mobile phones. So when they'd all gone off, he couldn't call them back and say, hey, come back and review and let's see how it's going. So I think one of them looked for 100 years, which was, was known as serious project overrun. And that's how he became a legend. But far more importantly, you sometimes need to do things in multiple parallels. Any final questions? Did I do what you asked me to do? Well, that's it. Okay, I'm done. Good luck with your innovation. Thank you.